pesquisa sobre qualidade. É. Será que eu preciso repetir, Ana? Talvez, né? Não estava gravando. É, bom, desenvolve pesquisas sobre qualidade e desenvolvimento da formação de professores, é, principalmente em escala global. Sua atuação inicial como professora foi na área de, da educação geográfica, na educação básica e na área de formação de professores de geografia no Instituto de Educação da Universidade de Londres. E com especial atenção é sobre o conhecimento é, geográfico dos conteúdos ensinados. Sua pesquisa mais recente focalizou a, a questão da qualidade da formação inicial docente em escala global. Então, vamos agora iniciar. E ouvi-la. Mais uma vez, obrigada. Well, thank you. I mean, what a wonderful way to start uh, my, my evening, your afternoon. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's a real pleasure to be invited to be here and to share with you some of the things that I've been working on recently. Um, and I'm going to dive straight in. Um, my title today is about quality and space. And, and with that wonderful introduction, you'll see that those two themes have been a real part of my career so far. So particularly as a geographer, I've been really interested in space. And as somebody involved in initial teacher education, I've been really, really interested in this idea of quality. And what I've come to understand is that these two come together and they're really important when they come together to help us understand change and also to help understand how context affects how we, how we prepare teachers. On my first slide, you'll see there's a little, little bit of my book where most of this work that I'm talking about today, it, I've written about in there. So that's a little advert. I promise I won't plug it anymore, um, but I'll go straight in and begin. So for me, the real issue um, that I've become aware of recently is that internationally everybody seems to be moving towards this idea of the practice turn in teacher education and, and I'm seeing this very much within the English context but in my travels I've seen that this is happening everywhere where I've, where I've been and I've talked about teacher education that the focus the trend seems to be on the practice. Let, let's make teacher education all about what happens in the classroom. And whilst, of course, when you're preparing teachers, what they do in the classroom is incredibly important, of course it is, but it seems to me that there's so much more about becoming a teacher than just what you do in the classroom. And so really important for me to think what is this practice term doing about teacher education and what are we leaving out when we focus on the practice term? And my big concern here is that this is an aspatial view of professional education. And, and what I mean by that is it seems to be the same all around the world. We're talking about the same ideas. We're talking about the same kind of focus. And it seems to me that actually because everywhere is so different. Teaching is really different. Teaching in Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo is very different to teaching in London. And therefore we need a more nuanced way of understanding what the kind of preparation that teachers need. And therefore what I'm proposing is that I think quality teacher education should be defined and it should be understood spatially. And, and that's the, the argument that I'm going to talk about um, today and that I'm, I'm going to share with you. And 
it's based on um, some research that I did a couple of years ago. In fact, I remember that my last trip to Brazil, I was just starting to think about these kinds of ideas. And I remember sharing them with colleagues uh, at the university. And so these ideas really started there. But the research that I did, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, this is my research question. I was interested in what are the features of high quality, large scale initial teacher education. And, and I'll explain why the large scale was important. But I really wanted to understand how places that were doing initial teacher education to high quality at a large scale, what were they doing? What, 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 why, was it, why was it so good? So I went to these five universities, so um, UCL Institute of Education, it's my, my own university, um, OISE in Toronto, in fact, that one I had to do remotely because of COVID, so I couldn't actually travel there, but the University of Auckland in New Zealand, um, Queensland University of Technology, or QUT in Brisbane, Australia, and then Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College, which is at Arizona State University in Arizona. You'll notice they're all English speaking, predominantly English speaking universities. And that's because that was my language. And I felt that it was, if I was going to try to understand what was going on, it would be really important for me to, to speak the same language. But of course, that does mean that the research is quite partial. And what I did was I visited those places. Um, I talked to people, I talked to teacher educators, students, schools, I participated in everything that happened there, meetings, conferences, and I also looked at all their documentation. But crucially, really importantly, in each location, I worked with a gatekeeper. And this was somebody who was based in that university who worked with me to help facilitate my access to all the things that I needed access to, but also to check that I wasn't just looking at this through my London colored glasses, but that I was actually understanding what was going on in the same way that they were understanding what was going on too. So that's what I did. And this is what I found out. Everywhere, people were talking about quality. For everywhere I went, Everybody was saying quality is important. We're under lots of pressure to have better quality. We're getting new accountability systems to do with quality. Quality is the big question. But within that, when I started to ask, well, what do you mean? What, what, what's, what's happening here? I was seeing the same themes come up, but presented in quite different ways. And, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about each of those. Firstly, first and foremost, the main issue was a, about the supply of teachers. Everywhere was concerned about getting the right numbers of teachers. But in different places, that was being expressed in different ways. So in Australia, where they've got lots and lots of a very uh, diverse and dispersed population, the real issue was about getting teachers in rural and remote communities, communities in the outback where, where there were very, very few people. They really needed good teachers there and people didn't want to go there. In New Zealand, the issue was about disadvantaged communities. So particularly, how could they get people to connect with and work with Maori and Pacifica Islander students. Those were the real communities that they needed teachers for. And then in countries like London, for instance, or in, in places like London, the issue wasn't so much the supply of teachers, but the supply of the right type of teachers. So there was a real shortage of science teachers, mathematics teachers, we call them STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So it was, it was a particular type of teachers. But everywhere I went, this was a real driver as to what was important about um, how quality was being understood. So within that, what became a very significant issue was about the quality of applicants. 
And everybody was telling me it's so difficult to get good people to become teachers that we've had to lower our entry requirements. And there were real concerns then about the quality of people that were coming into teaching and if the right kind of people were, were considering to come into teaching. And, and that was having an impact on the quality of their courses. They also talked about the different roles of schools, placements, the school, the teaching practicum. And although this was a theme everywhere, it was really different in different places. So, for example, the role of the school in New Zealand was actually quite different to that in Australia. They were doing similar things, but they had different degrees of responsibility. And so therefore the quality issue was about how good are those schools doing the job that we expect them to do. And then the opposite side of that is well, what about the university based teacher educators? What was their role? What was their expectations? So in London, for instance, the expectation was that they were deeply, deeply involved in all aspects of what the new teachers were doing. Whereas in an America, in Arizona, there were two very separate types, the people that taught content courses and the people that did the placements. So there was a similar issue there, some similar theme, but expressed in different ways in different places. And then another theme that emerged across everywhere I visited was to what extent should teachers be introduced to research and what kind of research should they be introduced to and in what ways should they see their role in relation to research? Should they be people who conduct research themselves? Should they just read research? What, what kind of role do we expect them teachers and, and those oops, to have? And then Finally, and the really big question was, what is teacher education for? What are we doing preparing new teachers for? Do we want them to be classroom ready? So is it just so that they're ready to go into the classroom? Or do we want to give them everything they need so that they're educated for a full career, a long-term career in teaching? And this again was a dilemma in almost everywhere that I visited. So, that's what I found from the visits. And, and what frustrated me about this was, although all these themes were the same everywhere I went, I really didn't feel as though I was getting a handle on what they meant when they were talking about quality. They were saying that these things were issues, but I wasn't really getting to the detail of being able to understand what it was about this that differentiated a good quality course from one that was maybe not so great. So I turned to the literature. And what did the li literature say? Well, the research, again, I found very disappointing. The research talked about different policy approaches to teacher education. They talked about ways of defining quality um, in initial teacher education and who decides whose responsibility it was, whether it was policymakers or teachers or schools. And they seem to take quite binary positions. So gen generally tended to be the traditional versus the progressive ideas, and very much based in, in a binary kind of way. And the recurring issues that kept emerging through all of the research was the theory practice divide, the ways in which theory and practice came together, concerns about partnership and mentoring the, and that it just wasn't good enough to give the new teachers what they needed. And then that question, coming back to research again, what is it that new teachers need? What does a course need to provide for them? But more than that, what I found in the research was that it tended to be quite small scale, quite reflective, self-study and very evaluative. And, and, and this frustrated me because I think, I think if you're doing a piece of research with 20 people, it's quite easy to say, oh, this is good quality or this made a difference. My courses had 2000 people on them. It's much more challenging then to say, well, how does this thing that you've done on a small course with 20 people, how does that transfer to a big course with 2000? And, and I felt the research 
was really lacking in that notion of transferability. So again, I came away feeling that I didn't understand quality enough in enough detail. So at that point, I then turned to research in higher education. And, and this is where I, start, I, I became really interested in this work with Lee Harvey. Now, Lee Harvey worked very much in higher education, looking at what under, is understood by quality in higher education. And Harvey says that when people talk about quality, they tend to talk about two separate things. They talk about quality in one dimension, or they talk about standards. And he said in higher education, most conversations about quality are not really about quality. They're actually about standards. And he said those standards can be understood as being, and the four listed here, academic standards, which, you know, is this master's level? Is this doctoral level? Is this undergraduate level? That, you know, does it meet those kinds of expectations? Is it about a standard of competence? And this is particularly important, I think, for teacher education, because most places now have teacher standards. And so the question is, does this course meet the teacher standards? And of course, that doesn't really explain quality, because it all depends on how good the teacher standards are. If you have bad teacher standards, then it doesn't matter how if people meet them or not, they're not going to be good teachers. And then the two others were really about the student experience. So service standards, are students satisfied? Are they, are they getting the, ex the experience that they expect? And organisational standards, do they have everything they need at the right time? And this tends to be things like, is the library open? Is the, is the canteen, is the cafeteria, does it do good food? And, and those things, whilst important, don't really tell us what does it mean about being a good teacher. So then Harvey suggests, well, let's talk about different ways that we understand quality. And he suggests there are five ways in which quality is talked about in higher education. And, and the first one is quality, something is quality if it's seen to be exceptional, different to everybody else. And he said that tends to be something that's a prestigious program or a prestigious university. And that tends to be, well, that's prestigious because it's really difficult to get into. And therefore it has really high entry requirements. And Harvey argues that doesn't mean the course is any good. It just means that the course is difficult to get into. So exceptional doesn't necessarily mean high quality. Another definition is that a course is perfect or is consistent. In that sense, there are no defects, there's nothing wrong. Everybody gets the same experience. And that can be good if the experience for everybody is equally as high, but you can have consistent bad quality. So everybody gets the same experience, but it's not very good. So that not, is not necessarily about high quality. The third one, fitness for purpose. And this one is often linked to the standards of competence because fitness for purpose is that everybody gets what they need, that everybody is able to graduate. And so that working with standard of competence, if everybody meets the teacher standards, then you can say this is a quality course. But again, that only works logically if the teacher standards are a high expectation of what we want teachers to know and understand and be able to do. The fourth definition is value for money. And this is where the students or the schools or the partners think this is, we're getting a good deal. This is a good deal here. We, it's worthwhile, it, it's good for, for the money. And that tends to relate to service standards or organizational standards. But again, doesn't really explain what a good quality course looks like. So the key one is the fifth one on the list. And this is the one that Lee Harvey says really distinguishes high quality. And this is the one where about transformation. Now he says for education to be truly 
educational, it needs to transform somebody, it needs to make a change in a person. So in the case of teacher education, what we're looking at, it's a course that changes somebody from not being a teacher into being a teacher. And that, that course then enables that change to happen. It enables that change to, to take place. And that, he says, is really key to the idea of transformation. And there are two qualities within that. It's got to challenge the student and it's got to empower the student. So they've got to recognize that change that they've gone through, but they've also got to feel empowered because they've been through that change. Lee Harvey says that's the definition of quality in higher education. And I would argue that that's the definition of quality in teacher education. It's got to transform somebody from not being a teacher into being a teacher. So how do we do that? What does that look like? Well, I've been quite taken with the idea of signature pedagogies that come from Lee Shulman. And you might be familiar with Lee Shulman's work on pedagogical content knowledge, which is specific to teaching, but his work on signature pedagogies actually is about a range of professions. So if you think about becoming a doctor or becoming a dentist, there are certain pedagogies involved in becoming a doctor, like doing hospital rounds or with a dentist doing, doing practice on, on patients that is part of the learning process. Similarly, if you think about a lawyer, um, they have to do articles in chambers in order to learn casework to do with the law. Lee Shulman argues that these signature pedagogies they cover three fundamental elements of professional work, and that is to think like a professional, to perform like a professional, and to act with integrity. And when we think about this in relation to teaching, we can say, absolutely, we want somebody who thinks like a teacher, we want somebody who's able to perform in the classroom, who's able to teach, but we also want a teacher to make good decisions. We need them to act with integrity. And Lee Shulman says that the professional preparation that enables this uh, professional work to occur is made up of three structures. The surface structure, which is at the top level, which is the recognisable acts of teaching and learning how to perform as a professional. So that's very much the performance side. But that's then underpinned by a deep structure which is the thinking part, the shared understanding of how best to convey the knowledge and the thinking of that profession. And then the next level is what he calls the implicit structure, which is a shared understanding of the attitudes, values, dispositions that characterizes the morals that underpin that profession. And what Shulman argues is that teacher, of oh, all professions need to have those levels in order for there to be a signature pedagogy. Now, if you look at teacher education, any teacher education programme around the world is made up of a range of these elements that I've listed here. So every programme will have some kind of taught sessions or workshops there'll always be an element of example for of a classroom experience. There will always be the opportunity for mentoring, for some kind of feedback, um, for lesson observations, and perhaps some, some written work, assignments, portfolios, reflective activities. What we've noticed around the world is that policy is increasingly being prescriptive about what kinds of elements need to be in a teacher education program, which ones have to be there. And this is a mistake, in my view. The reason why it's a mistake is because these elements don't make up necessarily that signature pedagogy. What they do is they just create opportunities to learn. So however they're organized, however they're structured, they only become effective in a teacher education program when they come together and enable the new student to be able to think, to perform 
and to act with integrity. And therefore the combination of them requires the teacher educator to think about that surface structure, the deep structure and the implicit structure. I'll, I'll go on to some examples um, later on about how, how these come together. But the point here is that these elements just being there are not good enough. It's the thinking that, that means how they come together that makes the teacher education programme work. And we've seen this in some of the research that's particularly been done by Linda Darling-Hammond and Karen Hammoness into quality teacher education where they say really good quality courses are underpinned by these three elements. The promotion of a clear vision of teachers and teaching, a strong sense of program coherence, both conceptually and structurally, and that coherence reflects a shared understanding of teaching and learning between the students and also between the faculty. And that coherence comes together in the formation of professional identity. And then that also has to have a really strong curriculum that brings together the thinking and the teaching so that it's grounded in teaching practice. Now, those three elements that I've highlighted here, the vision, the coherence, and the curriculum, when they come together, they enable that surface, deep and implicit structures of a, of, of a pedagogy. So what I'm suggesting is that to think, to perform and to act with integrity, that the current approaches that are based around this practice turn are really focusing. And here I've said focusing on how to think and perform. I actually think it's actually they're focused on performing. Um, and you get a little sense of what it means to think like a teacher and a little and a limited sense of what it means to act with integrity. Now, there are some places and London is one, England is one, where actually people would say, but there is there is a sense of, of what we're about to achieve. But it's really focused on a very narrow um, concept of achievement, which is really based on attainment. So if if students get good exam results, job done. And I think there's much more to education than, than that. So let's take this idea of the practice term and I want to explain a little bit about why I think it's so flawed. Um, in my own system in, in the UK, there's a lot of talk about core practices and the practice-based teacher education, which, which you may be familiar with. Now, in many ways, this is a great initiative because what it does is it connects theory and practice, and it provides a way of integrating practices throughout teacher education. So, so in that sense, it's really seeking to do some, some good work and address some of the issues about quality. But it's also based in an American system where American teacher education programs tend to have practicums scheduled completely separately to methods courses. So the theory and the practice take place in two very different places on the course. And that means that for a student teacher to understand how to teach, they do need the elements of the core practices. They need representations and approximations of practice to connect that theory with the classroom practice. And they require the pedagogies of modeling and rehearsal. So in that context, I can see there's a really good place for these core practices. But what they do is they focus on a very particular type of teacher preparation. They focus on behavior, behavior management, behavior of the teacher, and they focus very specifically on what goes on inside the classroom, what happens during a lesson. They're dominated then by a pedagogy of repetition. So people repeat certain practices until they become automatic and they require what they call deliberate practice as a way of making sure that they're effective. So what they communicate is a very narrow and a very technical view of teaching. 
In England, we, we like to talk about teachers having a repertoire of teaching techniques, but that's underpinned by a reservoir of knowledge and understanding that helps them understand why those techniques work. What the core practice movement does is it focuses entirely on repertoire and there's no development of the reservoir of knowledge. And a really good example here is where teacher education programs have been based on books like Doug, Doug Moff's Teach Like a Champion, where there are a series of moves, which are classroom behaviors that the teacher adopts that, that he claims is about effective teaching. But my argument is that they're very, very narrow definition of what a teacher is. Now, the important thing about the, these kind of movements is the ways in which they've been challenged, particularly through decolonial um, uh, acad 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 academics and also feminists as well. And, and they ask, when you're defining these core practices, who defines what is core? Who says that this is an important practice? And, and a really good example here is that some of the moves that, that are involved in that book, Douglas Moff's uh, moves, have been really controversial because of the way that they recreate within the classroom the same inequalities that we see in society. Similarly, the, the definition of core or the definition of quality itself is defined by those in power and therefore it sustains the status quo, and there's very little opportunity for alternative voices and alternative perspectives of what quality could look like. So what this means is that these, these approaches, they focus on behaviours of the teacher, but what they don't talk about is justice, they don't talk about equity, and they don't talk about the elements that make up social justice within the classroom. They're what Philip and colleague call prescriptive practices that aren't gonna change society, but ensure that, that power and privilege stay with the people that already have it. In addition to that, these approaches, they, they assume that everybody has an even starting point, that all students are the same, and they all start with the same kind of access um, to, to the opportunities. So these approaches are blind to privilege and they're blind to advantage. They don't recognise that some children may need different kinds of support to others. And they also assume that the teacher is the only influence on achievement. So they don't recognise the importance of communities, of families and social structures in enabling or constraining a young person's achievement. So does this meet our definition of quality? Does this, does this idea of core practice or the practice term, does it result in transformation? Well, it's really strong on the surface structure. It's really strong on the behavior of the teacher, what can be seen, the epistemological. But it doesn't give any attention to the deep structure, and it really is quite concerning about the messages that it sends about the implicit structure. So this kind of approach, it ignores the body and its role in education and how different bodies experience education. And it also ignores the social context of teaching and of learning. Now, as a geographer, when I start hearing this kind of um, critique, when I start hearing these kind of elements, it immediately makes me think about spatial theories and how spatial theories recognize the body and society and some of these challenges. So in order to understand this, I moved towards spatial theory as a way of giving me an alternative way of understanding this work. And I've used here spatial theory that's, that's come from uh, the work of Henri Lefebvre and also David Harvey, Harvey, who both came up with a triad of spatial theory. And in that spatial theory, they, they said that space is important in three ways. The first one is about location. So where a place is situated and how that affects 
the lived experiences of people located there. So for instance, in my own town, the experience of teaching in a inner city part of London where there's lots of diversity is very, very different to teaching in a, a leafy suburb of London where people are much more middle class and have got a lot more money and a lot more uh, opportunities there. So where um, the education is situated is quite important. The second one is about relative space about how spaces relate to each other. So how teaching in London is influenced by what's going on in that community, which is also influenced by what's going on nationally, which is then influenced by debates that happen internationally and globally, and how all of those elements are affected by history, culture, and politics. So how all of those relative notions of space relate to each other. And then finally, the idea of representational space, which is how ideas are represented spatially and how they're mediated by power and, and uh, an opportunity. And I think if we go back to those elements that I, I started with at the beginning, where we talked about the same issues, but experienced in different ways, we can see how this element of where a place is situated is significant, how that relates to certain ideas and thoughts that are represented spatially can influence practice. That's really key here too. And we can also start to see a little bit about that idea of power and representation and how that gets manifest within the ways that people were understanding, understanding quality. So taking this idea, I was trying to think, well, how do teacher educators work with this? How, when you've got this complex range of factors going on, how do teacher educators make it work? How do they make it happen? And what I did was I came up with this model um, of how that, that spatial became situated in the practice of teacher educators. And, and this model has got three knowledges within it, and they're all spatial knowledges. So the first one is the situated knowledge of what it means to be like in that place, what it means to be a teacher educator in London, in, in Rio de Janeiro, in, in, in wherever you are. What, what are the particular things that are going on in that place that are affecting the work that you do? And that's related to the capacity to change, which is simply what are the rules here? Which bits can you change? which bits can't you change, what, 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 what's the capacity to make change happen. And then next to that is what can I, as a teacher educator, do in relation to those other two? So in what way can I use my expertise to be adaptive to that situation? And in the places that I visited, this is what I saw taking place. I saw teacher educators situating their practice within these spatial knowledges and affecting the way that they did their work in order to make it happen. They were really good at understanding the dominant ideas of what's valued and who decides. So they had really good under oops, done again, really good understanding of the local context, a really good understanding of the policies within that local context, the contextual influences on their work and how they could uh, adapt their practice to make it successful. They really understood where power and agency lied within the system. So I wanna give you some examples of, of, of where that worked and, and what that work looked like. I'm gonna give you three short examples. Um, so the first one, is Kelvin Grove uh, Teacher Education College, um, which is based in Queensland, um, and they worked with uh, QUT, uh, Queensland University of Technology, and it's a, it's a center of excellence. Um, and they work specifically in preparing teachers for rural and remote communities in Queensland. So, so we're talking about here going to schools where you might have two families, um, you might you, you can't get there by road, there's no road to get there, the only way to get there is by plane, um, you know, really, really isolated communities, often with people involved in mining. Um, you might, if as a teacher there, you might live with 
the head teacher who's actually the only other teacher within that school um, and all the children come from the small selection of families that are there. So they're very, very particular communities. And what they found in Queensland is that new teachers are frightened to go there. New teachers are really worried about what it's like to work in those places. So the, the Kelvin Grove uh, Teacher Education College of Excellence, what they did is they worked with four particular um, uh, methods that they used in order to make that work. The first one is what they called myth busting. Um, people were, were scared. People thought, if I go there, I'm going to get attacked. I'm going to be isolated. So the first thing they do is they say, let's talk about these places. Let's talk about what they're really like. Let's talk about what it's really like to live there. So they, they myth bust. The second thing that they used is what they called judgment-free mentoring. So each of the teachers had a mentor and that mentor was not in any way connected with the assessment on their programs. They were just there to give support and, and it was completely judgment-free. They also introduced an idea of teachers talking to teachers. So in that sense, what they were doing is they were saying, um, the best way to learn how to teach in these areas is to talk to teachers who are already there and to really get that understanding of, of the li real lived experience of what it's like to teach in these places. And then the fourth one was very, very targeted feedback. So really helping them to adapt their own practice and to really understand how their practice needed to change when they were in these specialized area. Now, I would argue that this program achieves that idea of transformation because it worked with those three structures that we've talked about. It adapted novices and their practices for those particular communities, those rural and remote communities. So, so it was a talking about practice, which was affecting that surface structure. But then because of the way that they worked with other teachers, because of the way they were giving targeted feedback, they were also showing the application of knowledge and understanding of practices to that unfamiliar context. And in doing that, they were developing that deep structure that was completely necessary. But underpinning the whole programme was the idea that they needed to value rural communities, they needed to see rural communities positively, and that quality was an entitlement for all. So they were very explicitly addressing that implicit structure too. So that's my first example. My second example comes from um, Teaching for Equity in the University of Auckland. Now, I have to say, this picture isn't actually Auckland, um, but I just thought this picture was so beautiful that I had to include it. <laughs> so it's not actually Auckland. Auckland doesn't look like that. In, in Auckland, the real issue is about equity. Um, so they've got a whole range of achievement. It's quite a high performing country overall, but really varied for students from different backgrounds and students from different groups and a real issue of underachievement for students from uh, Maori or Pacifica Islander backgrounds. So the model of teacher education is based very much on this idea of equity for all and grounded in the bicultural national identity that New Zealand has. So there's a very strong emphasis on Maori principles around community and around knowledge and how that's affected within Maori culture. So that influences the ways they talk about knowing and the ways they talk about learning. They're all influenced by being Maori. And, and this is really exemplified in something they introduced called Mahitahi Days. And these Mahitahi is Maori for together as one. And in these days, they bring together the entire community, um, all the schools, all the teachers, all the student teachers, all the university staff, and they all focus on one lesson taught by one teacher that's been recorded. And they all watch this lesson and together as a community, they create understandings about what happened in that lesson, what was good, 
what could be done better and ways in which that class might go on to learn more um, in the next lesson, for example. That notion of coming together as one and working as a community on a shared problem. And this, I think, is another example of embedding local values and approaches, which has an emphasis on the surface structure, the practice of teaching. It's a strong connection with the deep structure, but a really strong theme of the implicit structure, which is really influenced by Maori values and Maori culture. That's my second example. I'll give you my third and last example, which is from Oise, um, which is based in Toronto in Canada. And they've got a very strong research orientated program, which is based on the idea of cohorts. So each cohort is a group of people within, within the um, program. They have themes. So the themes might be diversity, sustainability, technology, globalization. But everybody in that cohort, which includes the student teachers, the novice teachers, faculty members, but also the school districts and the schools within those school districts. And they all work together on collaborative research projects that focus on that particular theme and then are then located specifically within that school district. So what they do at OISI is they're using research within the practicum as a pedagogy to explore the surface structure and the deep structure but that seek to make the implicit structure explicit through the nature of the themes of the cohorts. So there were three examples there, and I, th I think they're three very different examples of how that notion of transformation linked to that categorization of um, the signature pedagogies is a, shows a different ways in which spatially quality can be defined and, and is defined differently because of those different spaces. And so that's the basis for my argument about bringing quality and space together. Expectations about teachers and about teacher educators are, I would argue, really defined spatially. They're defined in terms of what the needs are relative to others. For example, what, what kind of teachers we need, what the supply of teachers are that we need. They're defined in terms of how local problems are experienced and how they need to be addressed. And they're also defined in how power is experienced within the system and how power can move things and how they can prevent things from happening. And I would argue that this all influences how quality is defined and that for transformation to occur, it's the teacher educators that are really important because they need to know and understand these spatial knowledges and they need to adapt accordingly. So that's what I wanted to share with you um, this afternoon, so this evening. Um, just mention my book again, just in case anybody fancies looking at it. <laughs> There's my email address. And, Thank you all very much for listening. I'd be really happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Muito obrigada, Claire. Eu tô na sala de inglês ou português? Agora não sei. Português. Ah, tá. Então vou manter a sala de português. É, muito obrigada, Claire. Muito obrigada a todos os tradutores. São cinco tradutores. Peço desculpas de não estar tendo. Eu tenho 23 chamadas pelo WhatsApp, fora os e-mails que as pessoas estão tentando, eu tentando adicionar. Então, eu sou várias pessoas ao mesmo tempo da sala do Zoom e, e as demandas. Peço desculpas se eu não consegui atender a todos. E eu peço muita paciência a todos os intérpretes, é um trabalho belíssimo que todos estão feito em equipe até aqui, a equipe de Iraque e a equipe de tradução inglês-português, tá? E Claire, muito obrigada pela exposição de hoje, 
temos até um, um tempo muito bom de uma hora, que nosso teto é até as quatro. Então, <risos> foi com uma fala muito objetiva. Vou passar é, agora a palavra para a professora Maria Mauanes, Mauanes, que eu não havia, que eu havia pulado pelo nervosismo do tempo e porque eu também tinha é, pulado a gravação. <risos> Também sou isso, também eu estava gravando, então peço desculpas. Então vou passar a primeira anfitriã da casa, que é a nossa diretora, professora Maria Moanes, para fazer as falas é, de abertura do debate. E, em seguida, é, gostaria que os professores, pesquisadores, pós-graduandos e graduandos fizessem as suas inscrições para debate. Eh, gostaria também de agradecer a presença de outros colegas da Faculdade de Educação. Vi aqui que estamos presentes também o professor Enio, nosso colega muito próximo do Departamento de Geografia, um amigo muito querido, né, com quem divida a disciplina didática de Geografia, que está aqui presente conosco. Se o professor Enio puder abrir a resposta. Né? Tá? Então, por gentileza, professora Maria, a senhora está com a palavra. <coughs> Obrigada, Angelita, você é bem breve, não, enfim, eu, não, nem precisava ter passado a palavra, eu entendi o tumulto do momento, mas de qualquer forma é uma honra enorme poder estar aqui. A Angelita nos bastidores né, reforçou muito, inclusive com a Claire, o momento difícil né, de estar nesse lugar institucional, enfim, sobre o governo atual, no momento de pandemia, então a pressão toda desse momento e a dificuldade de dispor desses momentos, mas são esses momentos é, que são os, os meus os momentos em que, enfim, né, eu aprendo os momentos de prazer, os momentos em que a gente vive a potência da universidade, e isso, para mim, enfim, é de muito prazer e muito orgulho estar aqui, então, queria agradecer muitíssimo, Claire, é, aprendi muito, enfim, né, te ouvindo, Acho que isso nos engrandece muito né? enquanto universidade, a gente fazendo todas essas trocas que a gente busca fazer internamente no Brasil e agora essas trocas internacionais. E, então, assim, é um prazer enorme, só tenho a agradecer, agradecer também a Ana Angelita, a Ana Maria Monteiro, pela organização desse momento, enfim, que para a Faculdade de Educação tem um marco importante enfim, nesse diálogo que já se iniciou há muito tempo. Né? E a gente sabe, né, Angelito, o quanto foi difícil institucionalizá-lo. Mas que acho que tem, enfim, não, não sei se... Né, assim, um, um dos pontos de culminância nesse Anís Teixeira. Então, acho que é isso. Obrigada, Angelita. É, então, Ana, gostaria de dizer algumas palavras? Ouviu, Ana? Por favor, professora, fique à vontade. A senhora quer que eu tire... Eu vou manter o spotlight na Clare e nos tradutores, pode ser? Sim? Claro, certamente. Bem? Então, é, quero também agradecer muito, mais uma vez... Né? a apresentação, a presença, a apresentação né? da professora Claire Brooks, que apresentou um panorama da, da, da sua pesquisa internacional e reafirmar que esse momento, uh, eu acho que a Maria Moanes usou uma expressão que eu vou aproveitar, né? da está mostrando, deixando muito claro a potência da universidade, né? a potência dos estudos, pesquisas, debates que são realizados, né? e aqui no nosso caso, numa universidade pública, com a presença né, de colegas, estudantes da pós-graduação e da graduação, professores da educação básica, colegas de outras universidades e outros estados. É, também essa potência da universidade, né, é importante dizer aqui, é, que tornou possível... Né, Inclusive, é, esse, esse, a gente desenvolver e aprofundar o contato, o diálogo, a parceria com a professora Claire Brooks, é, que foi é, procurada pela professora... 
procurada por Ana Angelita, né? que a conheceu e buscou o contato, buscou o diálogo e pôde e que, através do programa da, da, da Universidade da CAPES, pôde realizar o seu pós-doc em Londres com ela, aprofundando essa relação, possibilitando, inclusive, essa participação aqui. Bom, eu queria... Eu, 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 atualmente, Claire, eu estou muito interessada né, no, no, na pesquisa, nos, nas questões envolvidas com os professores iniciantes. É, e é, as suas, a sua apresentação sobre a, a questão da qualidade da formação de professores né, me provocou né, para pensar né, do, do que... Você, não, você mencionou um pouco o caso da Nova Zelândia, se eu não estou enganada, né, de uma maneira geral, todos. É, aqui no Brasil, são pouquíssimos, ou quase inexistentes programas voltados para a, o professor iniciante, para a mentoria, para o apoio. Né? E eu queria ouvir você um pouco mais, se for possível, sobre né, nessas experiências que você acompanhou, como é que foi, como é que você viu essa questão do, do apoio ao professor iniciante. Obrigada. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, it's a it's a great question. Um, I think it's, I will. I'll start by saying I didn't see anybody who had fixed the problem. Everywhere I went, people said this is a problem, um, and it's and a problem that was manifest differently in different places, largely to do with the arrangements around um being in a school so so for example in some places schools were required to have new teachers and um teachers were required to mentor them um in other places teachers got paid more money if they mentored student teachers um And in other places, it was done entirely because they felt this was a professional thing to do. It's a professional obligation. It, it's what people had. But those different arrangements um, really affected the relationship between the university and the school. Because if teachers were being paid to do the work, then the university felt that they could be more, um, more demanding in terms of how that mentoring should take place. So they could insist that mentors went to mentor training, that they were trained to be mentors. They could insist they were given time to do the mentoring because there was a financial arrangement. Where it was entirely about being a professional, then, that was, then they couldn't do that. And so the, that relationship between the school and the university shifted. And the university did a lot more of that mentoring than, than the teachers did. Um, so they, they had to take, take that on. Um, and then what I saw in, in Arizona actually was a really interesting relationship where because Arizona's got a terrible um, shortage of teachers, it's got a huge problem getting enough teachers. So what they've done is they've moved all the practicum to the final year And in some places, not all, but in some places, um, the student teacher becomes employed by the school district. So they become teachers before they're qualified. And in that way, they create these teams of new teachers working with experienced teachers, all as colleagues working together. And they've got this, this process of teaming, that they call it. And that creates another different dynamic because the school, is invested in those teachers because they're new members of staff so they've got to support them they've got to make them good because they're, 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 they they're going to be teachers going on for, for further years so really really that relationship about the support is very much reflected on local circumstances um and i think you know when we, we've discussed this in, in my own um in in london in england and and we talk about If you want to change that supportive environment that teachers go in, you've got to look at 
the financial arrangements. You've got to look at the contractual, the really boring stuff, as well as the issues about how are mentors trained and how are men, how do mentors understand their role and what time and money are they given to perform it. That's, I think, really at the heart of it. Eu tenho vontade de falar mais, mas eu vou abrir para os outros. Ana, professora Ana, está com o som muito sim. baixo. Eu vou agora tirar o spotlight e nós temos uma ordem de inscrição de Arnaldo e a professora Carmen. Tá? Podemos fechar em... na fala da professora Carmen, pode se inscrever mais três pessoas. A gente tem até as quatro horas da o encontro de hoje. Quero também agradecer ao professor Roberto. Eu tinha visto a professora Dada. Tá? Todos estão presentes. Eu ainda não cumprimentei. As inscri... Então, vamos então, fazer assim. Vamos se inscrevendo, para profe... fechando o bloco de três. Pode ser assim? Ok, então, Arnaldo, é, vamos tentar fazer uma fala de três minutos, Arnaldo, que esse momento bem assembleia estudantil, pode ser, Arnaldo? Pode ser muito mais rápido, professor. <risos> Fique à vontade. É Boa uma tarde. honra poder fazer uma pergunta para a senhora, professora Claire. É, eu queria só saber se você já teve a vontade de repetir essa experiência de cinco escolas de excelência, só que num viés diferente. Por exemplo, cinco escolas, cinco é, é, instituições da América Latina. E o que, que você conseguiria trazer para nós em termos de reflexão? O que, que você esperaria encontrar se você fosse para um outro, um outro tipo de, de, de escolha? Né? É isso, escolha dessas instituições. Thank you. That, I mean, that's a great question. Um, it's a it's a great question. And as I said, I, my background is as a geographer. So um, anything for me that involves getting on a plane um, is deep joy, <laughs> deep, deep joy. <laughs> um, and I think um, I initially, when I wanted to do the research, initially, I wanted to go to lots of different places. I, um, I've got strong connections in China. Um, obviously, I've got very strong connections with Brazil, with Chile, um, and also I wanted to go to places in Europe. I wanted to go to Germany. I wanted to go to France. Turns out that all costs quite a lot of money. Um, I didn't. I didn't have the, the the facility to be able to do all of that. I think one of the things that is really, really central um, to my understanding and that idea of spatial spatial thinking is the is the, the very strong relationship between education and culture. How we educate our communities is very much about who we are and what we value and what we think is, is important. And, and that's absolutely intrinsic to how we structure education and how we structure teacher education. Um, I've, I've done some, some work and some, some writing with Angelita and with a, a colleague um, in, of ours in, in Chile, Victor, and, um, and we've, we've talked through that process about some of the differences that we've experienced in, in our various contexts. And at the moment, I don't know enough about what the education systems across Latin America are like to be able to really comment in, in a detailed way to your question. But what I suspect that I would see is the same kinds of themes emerging about um, equality, about access, about diversity, and how those are differently arranged within the university and the school structures and what gets prioritized and what gets deprioritized. And I think what's absolutely central to that 
is the, the areas that governments seek to control. Um, so what's happened in, in, my, in, in my country, and this happened during COVID, when everybody was dealing with the pandemic, the government introduced a whole scale market review of everybody who does teacher education. So every institution has had to reapply to be accredited to do teacher education. It's deeply cynical to do that during a pandemic when obviously there were lots of other worries and issues that we had. But what they sought to do within that is to control the curriculum that we all have to provide through our courses. And that's based on an assumption that if you control the curriculum, you control the knowledge, you can control what people think, and that will affect practices. I, and I think that I'm, I'm using that as an example, because I think what it is that governments seek to control is really indicative of the ways in which practices can occur. And also the ingenuity of teacher educators as they work out how to work around <laughs> those different policies in order to make sure that what they do is really good quality. Um, so I'm not sure I've entirely answered your question, um, but I hope, you know, I mean, I, I, would, I would love to, to explore different parts of the world and how this gets manifest in different ways and, and to explore different um, linguistic communities, because obviously everything that I looked at was um, from an Anglo, um, an English speaking perspective, and that gives a very particular view. I would really love to see what it would be like within different linguistic communities, what gets privileged and what gets controlled. And, and that relates, of course, of course, to all those ideas about power and agency. Um, I think that would be really fascinating. So if you want to invite me, I'll come. I'll definitely come. <laughs> professora, é, é, nas inscrições está a professora Carmen Straforini e o Enio, agora Maurício também. Pode ser, por gentileza, professora Carmen. Professora Carmen. Boa tarde a todos e a todas. Quero também começar a agradecer, Claire, que bom te rever. A gente esteve juntos aí quando você esteve no Brasil, lá no gabinete, na época era diretora, agora a Maria Mendes que está com essa missão. É, eu queria primeiro agradecer, e a minha pergunta é uma pergunta muito em, assim, em termos da, da própria pesquisa, como você foi apresentando, e, e, e a ideia que vai de alguma forma... É, no final, você, se, eu, se eu entendi bem, eu quero primeiro confirmar, é que você traz uma nova forma, talvez, a partir dessa pesquisa, que, se eu entendi bem, ela foi dividida em algumas etapas, a partir dos, uma, uma, no final de uma pesquisa, você né, tra, trabalhava com outras questões que apareciam durante aquela pesquisa, que você, de alguma forma, define a qualidade como transformação, quer dizer, você traz a ideia de transformação como um novo padrão de qualidade, quer dizer, a tua preocupação inicial era entender é, o que, que seria a, quali a qualidade né, das, do, de formação de professores, aqui no Brasil também essa palavra é muito utilizada, é, muito disputada, inclusive, você a partir daí escuta, vai entender como é que isso, né, quais são as demandas que os professores e as instituições é, de alguma forma formulam, vai aos teóricos, percebe que essa, essas diferenças, né, de, essas distinções de qualidade não dão conta, e a teoria espacial, que você vai à teoria espacial, as teorizações espaciais, para buscar um novo padrão de qualidade e traz a ideia de transformação. Então, em cima disso, eu tinha duas perguntas. Uma primeira é, essa ideia de transformação, né, ela já não traz em si uma ideia de qualidade? Eu acho que nós, de alguma forma, no nosso, no nosso fazer profissional, a gente está querendo sempre, a priori, transformar. Né? ou fazer com que, pessoa, que aquela pessoa, aquele sujeito, saia daquele lugar. E a gente já parte de uma ideia que é que é que que eu acho que é assim, é transformar e o sentido dessa transformação, né? Porque o que seria, então, transformar? Né? Se a gente fizesse... Eu não sei se eu estou sendo clara, mas 
A palavra transformação, a gente opera no início já com uma ideia que algo é melhor do que o outro onde está para ir para outro lugar, ou ficar no mesmo lugar. Ou porque A palavra transformação, no meu entendimento, carrega uma ideia já de qualidade. Então, essa é a primeira que eu fiquei pensando aqui. E a segunda questão era... Você fez uma, pegou nas teorias espaciais, eu não sou da geografia, sou da história, mas né, trabalho também com a... Tenho o prazer de ter, ter tido a Angelita como orientadora e agora como colega de trabalho, de pesquisa, de escrita. É, e ela me apresentou a Dora Imassen, que faz uma definição de teoria espacial pela multiplicidade, pela diferença. Aí eu fiquei pensando se essa ideia da diferença... Né, que o espaço como diferença, que eu acho extremamente potente, também não poderia entrar nessa discussão e talvez até nos ajudar a pensar a ideia de transformação. Eu estou sendo muito ousado porque eu não sou da de geografia, tá, Cléria? Peço desculpa se eu estou falando besteira aqui. Por que, que eu estou me preocupando? Porque eu acho que a gente... E você fala muito de escala, né? Pelo menos a Angelita fala muito de escala. E hoje, no complexo, a gente está com uma escala, né? se a gente pensar só numa rede no Rio de Janeiro, são 1.500 escolas. A UFRJ, ela, ela tem, se alguém aqui possa me ajudar, mas Maria Monte talvez, mas nós estamos numa, você falou na Inglaterra, 2 mil, nós estamos só na UFRJ, 6 mil e 600. Então, a gente, é, eu acho que a ideia da diferença, né, eu acho que você fala, no, a ideia da diferença, eu acho que ela aparece na, na, no segundo padrão, lá do, no segundo padrão, não, no segundo teoria espacial, né, que é a relacional, eu acho que ela está talvez implícita ali. Mas talvez explorar essa diferença como multiplicidade, né, e como, como inacabamento, talvez, que o espaço me parece nos trazer também, não seria potente. Mas fora, eu acho que você traz a ideia, já para concluir, né, quero te parabenizar, porque eu acho que você abre um caminho, né, abre pistas de investigação para pensar a formação de professores extremamente originais, porque eu, eu, pelo menos, não conheço outras pessoas que estão fazendo essa articulação com as teorias espaciais. E nós, historiadores, né, temos a, uma, um hábito muito ruim de botar, colocar o espaço no fixo no tempo. Né? O espaço é o contrário do tempo. Eu acho que a Dori Massa me, me ensinou muita coisa quando eu ali e desconstruiu essa ideia. Nós, historiadores, achamos que o espaço é um lugar fixo, né? um lugar engessado. Então, é isso. Não, é mais para a gente conversar, tá, Clara? Eu, eu fiquei pensando, achei extremamente bacana, é, eu diria provocadora a tua intervenção e Gostaria de continuar essa conversa. Obrigada. Thank you, Carmen. That's a that's a it's really lovely to hear how you've engaged with what I've talked about today. So that's been thank you so much for doing that. That's uh, it's really heartening to hear to hear what you have to say. Um, I I think it's interesting what you've said about transformation. That it has an implied notion of quality within it and I, I don't agree. Um, I think that transformation by itself just means change. Um, and, and in fact, in, in my own institution, we, in, we use the word transformation in our mission statement. You know how institutions always have mission statements. And we used it in the mission statement and everybody said, uh, 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 no, 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 you've got to say to transform for the better because things can actually get worse you know? and change in itself doesn't isn't necessarily an improvement and and i think that's where the notion of transformation as part of quality is really key because if you want to transform things for the better you've got to have an understanding of where they are now and you've got to have an understanding of what better looks like. And I think that's where spatial theory comes in because of that idea of representation, is that you have to ask, what does better look like in this context, in this place where we're at now? Um, and, and I think that's quite, quite central to it. Um, with Lee Harvey, when he uses the idea of transformation, he describes it as being the only thing that's truly educational. And I think, and again, speaking from, from my own context, there are lots of ideas about improving higher education that I don't think are transformational. So, um, so we've got a number of metrics, for instance, about student satisfaction surveys. And um, the way that this changes educational practices is the student becomes, is seen as the consumer so education becomes giving the student what they say they want 
rather than what they need in order to be educated. Um, and I strongly believe that education sometimes has to be difficult. It's something, you know, you have to struggle with it in order to, 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 to transform, in order to, to get better, in order to, to make the changes that are needed. It's like learning to teach is not always easy. Sometimes there are struggles mm -hmm. to be had. And so some of the other ways of thinking about quality, which are really strong within, within my context, are actually sometimes, I would say, anti-quality. They actually make things worse rather than making them better. And so that's where I think that idea of transformation for the better, how to make things better, I think is, 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 a, is a useful idea. It's also tied up with empowerment. And I think that's a very strong educational idea that we educate people in order to make them more autonomous, more independent, to enable them to be empowered. Um, and I think that that notion of transformation, it, 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 it speaks to, to that to some extent. And, and it is, it is I, I totally agree with you, it's already widely used across different educational institutions. Um, but I think I, I, I feel that it's really important that we, we think about it quite deeply about what is needed in order for that transformation to occur, because I think sometimes we, we, we don't. Um, that, that's my view. And then it's a delight to hear a historian talking about Doreen Massey. <laughs> She's, she's amazing, or was amazing. She's you know, what a fantastic person. And of course, her, one of her big contributions was talking about the relational aspects of thinking about things, that when we think about spaces, when we think about difference, we're always thinking about how things relate to each other. And I think that's one of the strong concepts that links space and time together, because one of the really important things about understanding time is knowing how the past shapes the present and how the present will shape the future. And the same thing about space is that it's very much about how does being here is being, how is that affected by elsewhere? And how does that influence who we are and what we do? And, and I think when we talk about teacher education, we've got to understand global international tables we've got to understand the importance of, of the whole way in which education has become marketized and globalized and and how the fact that it's been turned into a market is is you know it, it's kind of scary and, and really frightening and so bringing those two together the idea of, of space and time um, and I'm sure you and I, Carmen, might do that in slightly different ways, <laughs> but, but the, the two really can need to come together really, really importantly. And then the, the, the last thing that you said about scale is, is I think, really significant. In, in Australia, they talk about boutique programs. And I love this idea of boutique. They're, they're very small and, you know, they're very um, bespoke. And it's all about giving the student what they want and what they need. And, and everybody else says, that's easy when you've got 20 students. You know, it's easy when you've got 20 especially selected students. Then, you know, of course, they're going to have a great experience. Of course, they're going to be great teachers. But you can't scale that up. On the other side, I think in the United States, we're seeing large scale online programs that are kind of like learning to teach by just clicking through a number of, you know, a number of things like it's like learning to teach by, by, you know, using some kind of shopping channel or, or something like that, where you, you incrementally buy little bits. That to me is just as, as scary. Um, and I think that's where if we don't get a handle on scale, um, then other people will, and, and that will be quite, I think that that's the issue that's, that's coming up, particularly as there are so many um, concerns with teacher supply all around the world. Um, the more we need teachers, the more we need to find ways of educating teachers at scale and to a high quality. So Carmen, I agree with you. I would love us to talk about this some more. 
um, I think it's a really exciting conversation. I'm really glad that you 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 were interested in what I've been saying this afternoon. So thank you, thank you for that. Obrigada, Clara. Vamos continuar essa conversa. Obrigada mesmo. Professor Straforini, por gentileza. Professor Straforini, por gentileza. Sim, sim. É, estão me ouvindo? Estamos, estamos te ouvindo. Claire, eu gostaria de agradecer enormemente a sua apresentação. É, sempre muito clara, muito, né, muito explícita é, na defesa dos seus pontos de vista, no seu argumento. Né? Para nós que estamos aqui do lado de cá, é, é também uma aprendizagem é, nesta comunicação. Né? Eu fico aqui é, aprendendo né, como ser também tão explícito em um tema tão complexo como foi esse que você trouxe para nós. Eu tinha uma primeira pergunta, mas que já foi respondida na questão é, que inicialmente foi feita a você. Mas agora, nessa é, construção que você fez com a professora Carmen, eu fiquei me perguntando e, e retomando um pouco do seu livro, do seu argumento sobre a bússola profissional. É, me parece que também neste argumento que você traz agora para a gente, né, da potência da dimensão do espaço né, é, na formação, ou, ou, no tensionamento da formação docente, é, há muito dessa perspectiva do professor em relação ao seu próprio conhecimento de formação. Né? Porque se a gente pensar... Né, naquele tripé, naquele triângulo que você coloca, né, do locacional, do relativo e do representacional, a depender né, da formação e de como ele concebe né, a sua geografia, ele vai ter respostas muito específicas né, para isso. Daí que né, uma formação, é, uma formação docente em que é, esses elementos estejam claros né, e também abertos, não tão fechados, né, que o aluno possa identificar as diferentes correntes, as diferentes concepções, possa ser potente. Mas a minha questão é a seguinte, diz respeito a, a esse professor, né, já estou pensando, o professor início de carreira, que se depara diante de um, de um contexto locacional onde está a sua escola. Então, esse professor, ele vem de, uma, de um outro lugar, de um outro locacional, de um outro, uma outra dimensão relativa do espaço e de uma outra dimensão também representacional do espaço. E aí eu te pergunto porque eu tô, fiquei com isso na cabeça, se o sentido de alteridade né, ele pode ser aplicado nesta relação espacial entre um professor, a dimensão escolar, os seus alunos, é, se você pensou sobre isso, né, essa alteridade que vai também constituindo esse professor e esse aluno. É um pouco sobre isso, eu não sei se eu me fiz claro. I I I understand you, Rafael. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Um it's as you were as you were asking the question, I, I was thinking about um a conversation that I had recently with a colleague who's based in Northern Ireland. Um and Northern Ireland has got a different teacher education system than we have in England. And he was saying that the big problem in Northern Ireland is that it's really difficult. And there's a very small number of places to be a teacher. And being a teacher is a very high status profession in Northern Ireland. So the only people who can become teachers 
are ones that are already well educated, they tend to be middle class, they tend to be girls, um, and it tends to be that, that this is their chosen career that they do as soon as they, uh, they leave school, they go into teaching, and they tend to come from a particular background, a particular class system, a particular sort of particular type. But the schools in Northern Ireland are really diverse. And the schools in Northern Ireland have a lot of children with very, very different needs. Um, you know, with lots of children that, have, that, have, that experience quite a lot of poverty, um, children that don't necessarily come from uh, a family where, where they'll be read to or where education is kind of given a high priority. And this colleague was saying to me, um, because of the way the education system is set up, the people who are becoming teachers are not the sorts of people that the schools need. <laughs> they, they don't understand these communities. They don't understand what their needs are, what the priorities are, and what they have. And so therefore, everybody, it fails. You know, the, the new teachers don't understand their kids, don't understand what they're talking about. The teachers, the, the, the children don't understand the new teachers. You know, it's a really, really tough situation. And I, I think that goes some way to, to exemplifying how important your question is. Because one of, the, one of the fears that I have is that through this kind of analysis, what we do is we start to say, once a London teacher, you can only be a London teacher. Or if you're a teacher for this kind of school, you can only work in this kind of school. And, and I think that's really problematic. I think that's really, really dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, part of what I think the, the spatial stuff does is when we understand that our experience is spatially derived, it is, is about where we're at, then we start to understand what Dory Massey would call the other. So we start to understand how our experience is different to those of others. And that brings us to a deeper understanding of the globalized, what, what Doreen would call the global sense of place. So you start to understand not just yourself, but how you are different to the worlds around you. Now that's really underdeveloped in my work, um, but I think that that's something that's potentially very interesting to think about is what do we need to put into teacher education to enable people who've come from one context to move to transition into teaching in another context. And for me, those are really spatialized knowledges um, that we're talking about there. Um, but it's, it, it, I mean, it's a great, it's a great philosophical and practical question for us to think about, um, because I would be really reticent to think that you, that you, you, you limit a teacher's professional understanding by only preparing them for one type of environment. Um, surely that notion of, of, of thinking, performing and acting with integrity that gives us scope to be able to think then about other contexts and how we adapt and apply what we understand to those different contexts. Um, but I certainly agree with you, Raphael, that's something that um, we really need to do a lot more work on, I think. It's a really interesting question, so thank you for asking it. Imagina, obrigado você pela resposta. Muito obrigada, Rafael. Eu queria só reforçar aqui a todos que estão presentes. Eu fico extremamente feliz com a presença dos queridíssimos colegas, em especial a professora Dadai, o professor Rafael Staforini, colegas da Unicamp e da Federal da Paraíba, prestigiando a presença da Claire nesse momento aqui. É, queria recuperar agora as inscrições, tá? Nós iremos agora receber o professor Enio. O professor Enio fará a sua pergunta. E no momento da intervenção do professor Enio, a gente encerra as, as inscrições para pergunta. Lembrando que o evento vai terminar pontualmente 
às quatro horas. Então, a professora Claire vai por volta das é, dez para as quatro, digamos assim, a gente vai terminar a pergunta para ela fazer a fala final. Tá bem? Obrigada, hein? Uhum. Boa tarde a todas e todos. Me ouvem bem? Hi, Claire. I'm very happy that you are here with us. Enio, Enio, <risos> perdão, Enio. Não, eu sei, é só para falar, sim, eu entendi, eu sei, é só rapidinho para ela. Pergunta tá sem ter. I ah, hope to see you soon in person, of course. <risos> então, gente, é... quero agradecer a Claire, ela está aqui com a gente, é... Fico muito feliz dessa, dessa troca né, de... de experiências, dessa troca em relação à pesquisa dela. É, a minha pergunta vai um pouco na linha do Rafael, né, pensando na questão do professor. Né? Eu acho muito importante, Claire, que você chame a atenção é, da dimensão especial, espacial da formação dos professores, porque a vida de professor ela tem uma dimensão espacial fortíssima, né? como o Rafael já colocou aqui na pergunta dele, você na sua resposta também, no seu, no seu outro trabalho também. E eu demorei para entender isso enquanto professor, quando era professor de educação básica. E quem me ensinou essa importância desse, do contexto espacial, né, dessa dimensão espacial da nossa vida de professor, não foi nem um geógrafo, foi Paulo Freire. Né? Quando ele diz para a gente que é, você tem que entender o lugar que você está. Você é professor de acordo com aquele lugar e de acordo com que as pessoas estão ali. Então, entender as pessoas é entender aquele lugar também. Mas uma outra dimensão da vida de professor, que não é exatamente essa, embora esteja relacionada, é algo que aqui no Brasil, pelo menos aqui no Rio de Janeiro, a gente tem muito, que é o, é o deslocamento desse professor. Né? A gente se desloca muito e a gente se desloca por distâncias muito grandes, é, seja numa cidade grande, uma metrópole, numa região metropolitana, mas às vezes mudando de município para o outro. Eu mesmo, durante nove anos da minha vida de professor, eu saí do Rio de Janeiro ia para Angra dos Reis da aula, que é três horas de distância. Eu não ia voltava todo dia, claro, mas eu tinha que dormir lá, enfim. Isso é algo que se repete, a gente percebe isso aqui ainda. E eu queria saber se nas tuas pesquisas, né, e principalmente nessa agora, que você fez nesses outros países, se essa questão do deslocamento, da mobilidade de um lugar para o outro, se ela está presente, se você considera isso como uma dimensão espacial importante, porque isso traz para a gente uma série de coisas, não só deslocamento em si, que deixa a gente muitas vezes descansado, enfim, mas é isso que você acabou de falar respondendo, Rafael, né? A gente sai de um lugar e de um contexto e de todo um conjunto de pensamento para ir para outro e, e tentar entender esse outro, ou seja, é muita mudança, né? Nesse sentido, o que torna o magistério dar aula não algo muito simples nessa situação. Então, queria te ouvir em relação a isso. E, mais uma vez, obrigado por estar aqui com a gente. Well, thank you. Thank you for asking the question. Lovely to see you again. Um, really lovely. And um, it's, a, it's a really... It's a, it's a really puzzling dilemma, right? Because I think there are some things about teaching which are universal, right? But there are some things that are not universal and there are some things that are very context specific. And I think this is so when I um, when I was in Queensland, um, there was a, a lot of talk about these rural and remote communities. And, and some of these are not three hours away. They're three days away. <laughs> you know, they are they, the, the only way to get there is 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 by flying and then once you're there you you can't get out until the plane comes to take you home they're, they're, they're very extremely extremely remote <coughs> and i think what the, what was really interesting about that was that that wasn't just about location it wasn't just about the rural urban difference that you know one's very rural one's very urban but it was also the, the, the cultural differences that go with that. So in these places, you either had white miners, so white men who had gone to Australia to, to mine, and they were in these communities because they were mining and they were fairly nomadic. So they would be in one place and move around, depending on, on where they could find gold or whatever it was they were mining. So they, they were one 
one particular group. And then the other group were predominantly um, sort of Aboriginal communities. And, and what was really interesting about that was that those two, even though they were all both rural communities and had very similar characteristics of being rural communities, those two communities themselves were also quite different. And I, I talked to quite a few people who had worked in with indigenous communities and, and they were the predominantly white teachers who had worked in indigenous communities. And they were saying things like, oh, they never wear shoes and they sleep in their car. And, and they talked about these kinds of aspects as being the dominant cultural aspects. And there was one teacher that I spoke to who was actually originally from Ireland. So she'd gone from Ireland to Australia and then was working with these indigenous communities. And she said that she found really interesting that things that she thought were kind of normal and kind of okay um, were things that the Australians, the white Australians, got very upset about. And then there were things that she thought were quite unusual that the white Australians didn't seem to, to, to find. So, so I think that really illustrates your point that there are, I don't think there are barriers necessarily, but it is about that notion of self-knowledge. It's about understanding the, the things that you take for granted that you consider to be, um, you know, I mean, I. Wearing shoes, you know, I can totally understand why if you're if you're in a hot, dusty place, why you probably wouldn't want to wear shoes. I kind of, I kind of get it. Um, but the fact that that was seen as being an anti-educational thing, that you've got to wear shoes in school, seemed to me to be a really interesting cultural dimension. So I think there are so many aspects to this. I think some of it is about identity. Some of it is about rural, urban. Some of it is about social class. Some of it is about culture, cultural groups, but a lot of it is to do with the, those ideas about what we value and what we think is important. And that's the bit that I don't think the practice term in teacher education addresses, because it's all about, you know, how do you teach this? How do you teach that? How do you get the kids in the class? How do you get them out of the class? How do you start a lesson? How do you stop a lesson? How do you plan a lesson? None of it is about those social things about people's bodies, people's cultures, understanding what they what they expect out of education. That's the bit that I think is really missing from that. Um, but I think the Australia example is a really good one of how to support teachers who are making that really big move to, to places that they, they really didn't understand. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, Enya, I hope so. Desculpa, Enio, que eu te, inter te havia te interrompido. É que ela não vai te escutar falando inglês. Ah, entendi. Desculpa. Entendeu? Ela vai ficar só ouvindo a tradutora. Me perdoe. É... Ah. Das escolas São Maurício e Dadá. Tá bem? Temos pouquíssimos tempos. Temos dez minutos. Pedimos a compreensão de vocês. É, de ser sucinto. Tá? É... O que a gente tem das traduções. Ok? Por favor. Posso então, Ana? Obrigado. Boa tarde. Boa noite, Claire. Boa tarde a todos. É, eu acho que eu levantei a mão, Claire, para a interação de pergunta aqui, num momento muito próximo do Arnaldo e do professor Rafael. De modo que minha pergunta pode em algum grau repetir essa temática, mas eu acho que ela também amplia um pouco a questão. É, quando você traz Lichtman com a ideia do pensar, executar e o agir com integridade, eu automaticamente me questiono o quanto do teu trabalho incorporou ou não discussões a respeito da ética e da moral. Eu que gostaria de ouvir um pouco sobre isso. Em seguida, você, ao falar sobre é, a educação no Reino Unido durante o período pandêmico, indicou que as instituições que trabalham com o processo de formação de professores 
foram convocadas a se reinscrever, eu não entendi exatamente no que. E, na medida do possível, tem razão de um interesse pessoal, eu gostaria de uma ampliação sobre esse tópico. I'd, I'd be very, very happy to, very happy to. I might, and I'm conscious about time, so I'm going to try not to rant, um, but, but I might have a tendency to rant a little bit about this. So, so the first part about ethics and morality, I, I think that um, it, 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 an example of Australia, in Australia, they had a course that was um, Indigenous culture. And everybody in the university had to take this course on indigenous culture. And everybody I spoke to said it was terrible. Um, and the reason why it was terrible is by having a course in indigenous culture, it made it separate. It made it different. It emphasized that it was not as mainstream as white culture. And, and I think that's a real issue. And I think that, The, the important thing about the ethics and morals is it should permeate all of what we do. All of our work should have a strong ethical dimension to it. And, and if you ask me what my ideas are, that would be my, my big idea about that, is that everything about all of those elements of teacher education, we as teacher educators have to be asking ourselves, what are the implicit messages about values that we are communicating through this session. And sometimes we need to make those explicit and explain why we're doing that. And sometimes I think we need to really think through what it is that we're leaving out. What, what are the bits that we're not talking about? In, in the UK, we, we used to talk about a hidden curriculum. And I think that's, you know, often the ethics and the, the morals get hidden in what we do. Um, but I think it's really important that we, that we really think carefully about how our ethical positions are embedded throughout our courses, rather than just being, you know, and today, boys and girls, We're going to do ethics. You know, it really has to be embedded in, in what we're doing. Um, the second thing about the, the market review. So um, about, uh, I don't know, about, about 15 years ago, um, the government produced a, uh, a white paper, a, 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 a policy document um, that introduced school-led teacher education. And what that enabled was that schools could now train teachers without university. So it became a, what they call a school-led system. Um, this didn't work as effectively as they thought it would, but it now means that um, across England, there's a wide variety, a large number of different institutions that train teachers. Some schools, for example, might just train two or three teachers. Institutions like mine might do 2,000 teachers. So, so it, it's really varied. So one of the things that they said they wanted to do is to review that market. And it's interesting that they call it a market. And so what they did was they introduced um, a, and it's called a core content framework. So it's not a curriculum, but it's basically a list of content that needs to be in every teacher education program. They did that before the pandemic. And then while during the pandemic, they instituted a review of the market. And here they identified the biggest problem was consistency. So they had a list of quality requirements and every provider had to demonstrate that they could meet those quality requirements in order to continue to be involved in teacher education. So we call it an accreditation um, and every provider had to reapply. And, and there's two rounds and the first round, only one third of the, the people that applied were successful. So this is a way of them doing two things. One, controlling the content of the teacher education programs, and also in some ways 
controlling the way in which teacher education is, is done, but also it's a way of them choosing who does the teacher education. And they've deliberately made choices about who can remain to be providers and who are no longer able to be providers. So it's a really, um, a really interesting policy. It's a very interesting time to introduce the policy. We were given, I think, just six weeks to prepare our application for reaccreditation. Um, so it was a really, a really a, a massive upheaval, huge controversies. And the biggest controversy is that Oxford and Cambridge said they were going to move out of teacher education and they're not going to do it anymore. So that's how that's how that's how massive it was. And you know, I I I I've been in I've never before experienced this, but I've been in meetings with ministers, government ministers, secretaries of state, arguing with them across the table about this. It's been a very, very strange time. Um, but I don't recommend it. <laughs> that would be my final word. Um, it's been really disruptive and, and not good for our teacher education provision. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. Bom, gentileza, eu vou queria colocar a professora Dada, é uma, uma importante da história da educação geográfica no Brasil, uma professora muito querida de to todos nós. E eu não sei se a professora da data está aqui. Estou aqui, sim. Espera aí, deixa eu conseguir colocar, fixá-la. Espera aí que eu sou lenta na internet, gente, me perdoe. É que falta pouco tempo. Espera <risos> aí, deixa eu colocar da Dada, coloquei da Dada, recuperada da Covid, então ela tem que ter... Eu acho que representa esses tempos, a pessoa que está recuperada, renascida das cinzas. Bem recuperada, não, mas em recuperação, digamos <risos> assim. Entendeu? É. Então, eu queria, por gentileza, professora Dada, a senhora faz a sua fala, né, passando para a professora Clary, e a professora Clary, em seguida, também fazendo a sua palavra final. Ok. Vamos combinar assim? Combinado. Obrigada. Obrigada, eu. Claire, boa tarde. É um prazer estar aqui com você. Obrigada pela sua fala. É, estou aqui na universidade, como podem ver atrás, tem um jardim aqui, mas assistindo e aprendendo muito. É, a, minha, a minha pergunta, não sei bem se é uma pergunta, mas ela vai muito ao encontro daquilo que o Straforini e o Enio já tinham aqui destacado. Eu fui professora por 20 anos da escola básica e trabalhava com comunidades é, em São Paulo, com comunidades muito precárias, em condições é, de subsistência e em escolas é, também com condições muito precárias. E, ao mesmo tempo, eu era professora em escola de classe dominante, de classe A, né, de, de ricos em São Paulo. Então, eu vivia esse de certa forma, uma distopia entre esses lugares. Ora, eu estava em um lugar e ora em outro lugar. Mas é, eu penso que tem um outro elemento a destacar aí para os professores, além da experiência, no meu caso, que eu trago para esta universidade, é muitas escolas, inclusive eu andei lendo aí na Inglaterra também, a escolha do, do aluno para uma determinada escola, ela não diz muito respeito à, à sua comunidade. Ele também se matricula em escolas que são, por exemplo, é, tidas como escolas melhores e, por isto, estão mais destinadas a uma formação para o mercado e isto os atrai. Então, o professor vai trabalhar com alunos que são de diversas comunidades, de realidades diferentes, de lugares diferentes. E eu queria saber como é que isso tem acontecido e como vocês formam para essa situação. Né? Obrigada, Clé. Um beijo grande. Ó. 
para você e para todos. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, so good to see you. And look at your garden. I mean, all right, university garden, but you know, still lovely. <laughs> Um, it's a, it's, you know, it, it, while you were talking, I was thinking about my experience as a teacher educator in London, where we worked with about 700 schools across London, some of them best schools in the country, you know, some of them I've, I've been to Eton, you know, schools where, where our, our prime ministers and our royalty are educated. And then I've also been to schools that are at the very other end of the scale. When we say there's choice, there's only choice for some, or some have more choice than others. You know, the more money you have, the more choice you have, right? So not everybody has choice. Um, but the other thing is, and, and in my university, we have a policy that every student teacher experiences two contrasting schools. So if they go to one, you know, independent school, very wealthy children, then that second school will not be like that. A sec their second school will be in a much more diverse community. And, and that's because we want our teachers to be able to teach a wide spectrum. But also it's because I firmly believe the, the things that you do in those top schools, the things that, that teachers do in those top schools, benefit all children. They shouldn't just be reserved for the rich kids, right? That quality education is about, it, it, it is, is what we need in all of our schools and all of our teachers need to do. Now, you might have to do it differently in schools where you've got kids with more diverse needs. But the basic ideas of having high expectations, of planning really good lessons, holding children to account for their learning and supporting them and scaffolding them to make that learning, that applies whatever kind of school you're in. And I have seen terrible lessons in very good schools. <laughs> and I have seen brilliant lessons in very poor schools. You know, so I think we need to choice is a little bit. It's all for me. It's a word like fairness. You know, it kind of means different things to different people. Choice isn't always a good thing. All of our schools should be fantastic, and all of our teachers should be doing the things that they do in the really good schools when they do it really well. Um, I hope that I hope that explains my position on it a little bit. I don't know if I, if I if I've answered your question fully, but I I, I hope I have. Obrigada, querida. Já vamos não estar mais juntas. <laughs> hope so. Fazer a, a, vou pedir a Claire para fazer a palavra final, e convidando, antes de passar a palavra final para a Claire, assim, eu vou reiterar o agradecimento a todos os colegas, vou começar pelos colegas externos mesmo, que fizeram todos os sacrifícios de suas agendas. A gente está em pleno final de semestre, Claire. Você não faz ideia do que, que é o final de semestre das universidades públicas federais no Brasil com todas as provas para corrigir, com todos os editais para cumprir. Então, a gente está com a forca aqui, ó. e todos estiveram, fizeram o possível. São cerca de... Nós tivemos 60 pessoas, agora estão 44 no final, na, nas perguntas, presentes aqui. Isso é um coro alto, né? é, considerando o Brasil de hoje. É, nós queremos agradecer a todos os colegas da Faculdade de Educação, todos os técnicos, todos os alunos, todos os colegas do programa, todos os colegas do departamento. E esse, reforço um abraço especial à professora Carmen Tereza Gabriel, que está à frente do Complexo de Formação de Professores, e a professora Maria Moanes, na né, frente da direção da Faculdade de Educação, que também está também à frente de uma agenda muito é, difícil da faculdade nesse momento, mas que reservou um tempo para estar nesse debate. 
É, convido, reitero, vou passar a palavra para a professora Ana Monteiro, que vai fazer um convite, e é um convite à democracia. Eu peço a todos atenção para o convite do SAT da semana que vem. O SAT da semana que vem é um chamamento à democracia. E vou passar a palavra à professora Ana Monteiro, que foi quem trabalhou diretamente com o professor Darcy Ribeiro. Esse ano, Clé, faria 100 anos uma das figuras mais importantes da história da educação do Brasil, que é o professor Darcy Ribeiro, que foi um grande democrata, que foi deposto junto com João Goulart durante a ditadura militar e quem idealizou os CIEPs, Centros de Educação Integrada, e que foram comumente, popularmente conhecidos como brisolões. E se tivesse o CIEPs vingado, a gente teria uma outra história urbana né? na cidade e no estado do Rio de Janeiro. Mas eu vou passar para a professora Ana Monteiro, quem trabalhou com Darcy Ribeiro e quem vai estar à frente é, da discussão da semana que vem. Por favor, professora Ana. É, então, mais uma vez, agradecer né, essa apresentação que né, nos faz pensar muito, refletir, ter insights e convidar a todos e todas para a, o próximo seminário, né, que será realizado é, online a, na quinta-feira próxima, 4 de agosto, 17 horas e 30, é, e homenageando, é, celebrando a Darcy Ribeiro, né, que completa, completaria 100 anos de idade esse ano, né, um, um grande intelectual, antropólogo, né, e que teve uma atuação né, no Brasil muito, muito marcante, muito importante, é, sendo um dos criadores da Universidade de Brasília, né, é, muito inspirado em parceria com a Anísio Teixeira, um grande intelectual brasileiro que organizou, de alguma forma, o sistema educacional no Brasil. Né, e, posteriormente, do final do século XX, nos anos 90, é, inspirou a criação, pensou a criação de outra universidade, a Universidade Norte Fluminense, estadual, aqui no Rio de Janeiro. Então, a, nós convidamos é, duas professoras que atuaram com o Darcy Ribeiro, é, liderando o processo de implementação dos Centros Integrados de Educação Pública, CIEPs, no estado do Rio de Janeiro, professora Lia Faria, né? professora titular na UERJ atualmente, e a professora Lúcia Veloso Maurício, é professora associada também da UERJ, e que é, coordenaram né, o programa nos seus, né, durante dois governos aqui no Estado. É, e nós vamos é, pedir né, uma atenção especial ao programa de formação de professores que foi desenvolvido juntamente com a implantação dessas escolas de horário integral, de turno único, aqui no Rio de Janeiro, que era uma experiência muito nova na educação pública do Rio de Janeiro, e que também desenvolveu um, um, todo um programa de formação de professores simultaneamente à, à criação dessas escolas. Então, é, e que pensava, por exemplo, muito do que a Claire falou hoje, né? Na, no, nesse professor, que era um professor iniciante, tinha, era, pedia se que fossem iniciantes e que fossem é, de origem local. Né? Foram 500 escolas desse, desse modelo implementadas até 1994 e os professores eram recrutados né, nos municípios, nas áreas onde a escola era localizada e é, vivenciando uma formação em serviço na escola na, na, durante o seu trabalho. Enfim, nós vamos saber mais sobre o programa e convidamos, então, é, esse, a esse seminário, que é o nosso momento né, de é, afirmação né, da democracia, da universidade pública, da produção da ciência em nosso país e da formação de professores. Obrigada, então. Ok, eu tentei dividir o cartaz, mas não deu certo. 
mas eu faz, é, em breve o programa de pós-graduação vai fazer uh, o convite, vai encaminhar o convite para todos, e pelo site da Faculdade de Educação vocês poderão ter acesso tanto ao link quanto ao cartaz, ok? Mas é, a gente gostaria de reforçar aqui os nossos agradecimentos à Silvia e à Renata pelo belíssimo trabalho de intérpretes, nós gostaríamos de agradecer ao trabalho da Gisele, do Felipe, que está caindo, mas vamos ver que o Felipe retorna, e ao Jacó, pelo trabalho também de intérpretes de Libras. Muito obrigada, meninos. Eu sei que o trabalho de cinco intérpretes é um trabalho incansável. E agradeço novamente a presença de todos, em especial a generosidade e ao brilhantismo de Claire sempre estando presente, íntegra, inteira, em tudo que faz, Claire. Conte comigo e conte com a minha amizade. Fique com você com suas palavras finais. How do I follow that? <laughs> what, what, what can I say? Um, I mean, thanks to you, uh, Angelita. I mean, like, it's such a pleasure uh, working with you. And, and you've been an incredible gateway for me into all my friends uh, in Brazil now and, and wonderful people that are all here today and who facilitated this. So, so thank you so much for enabling that to happen and, um, and for allowing me to, to share this with you. And, and I'm you know, really grateful, as you say, it's a really um, difficult time of the year um, after what's been a really difficult three years. Um, so I'm, I'm really grateful to you all for coming and for engaging with, with some of these ideas in a really, really interesting way. You've, your question's brilliant and have really helped me to think through as well and have given me lots of ideas. So thank you for your participation. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you to the translators. I've never had my talk so done in sign before and it's fascinating to see somebody do it as you're as you're talking so thank you so much and I really look forward to taking this conversation with you all further and developing the ideas some more thank you so much for the opportunity obrigada gente finalizando aqui a gravação